Okay, so let's talk about the structure of prokaryotes and how that is set up. So one thing about them is that they are going to have a cell wall. So the cell wall is going to consist of pepto, peptidoglycan. So peptid is talking about protein, glycan, sugars, right? And so what's going to happen is that cell wall can be set up either as a very thick cell wall or a very thin one. And if it's very thick, we call it gram positive. And if it's very thin, we call it gram negative. So let me show you um, the difference between the two. So this is going to be an example of gram positive bacteria. So in this kind of off white color, that's going to be the cell wall. And here's a cross section. You can see it's very, very thick, but it's very simple. So the reason it's called gram positive is because there is a gram staining process you can do with bacteria. And what will happen is you um, use a dye called crystal violet and it's um, purple color. And what will happen is since this is such a spongy and uh, thick and simple cell wall, it just absorbs that dye. So that's why we call it gram positive because it shows positive for it. So gram positive bacteria is going to look um, purple underneath the microscope. As opposed to these pinkish ones here, those are going to be called gram negative bacteria. Gram negative bacteria have a different setup. They have a cell wall, as you can see in that off-white color, but it's very, very thin, and it's way more complex. It even has a membrane on the outside of it, right? So what happens in the grand staining process is that crystal violet doesn't really get absorbed, and it, once they do the rinsing, it actually gets rinsed off, and it just looks pink underneath the microscope after a couple of other steps. So gram-negative bacteria tends to look pink underneath the microscope. So there's some gram-negative, there's some gram-negative, gram-negative, and then these are gram-positive because they're really purple. So what's the big deal with these? Let's talk about that. Gram-positive bacteria, um, examples of them could be anthrax, botulism, staph infection, strep. Um, examples of gram-negative, E. coli, typhoid, cholera, meningitis, gonorrhea. Very, very fun ones. Um, so as far as disease-causing bacteria goes, in general, gram-negative ones tend to be a little bit more threatening than gram-positive ones. What I mean by that is... The gram-negative ones tend to be a little bit harder to fight with antibiotics because they do have that outer layer. So what can happen is that gram-negative bacteria can actually have to have a very specific antibiotic that is going to be needed to fight them, whereas with gram-positive bacteria, you can use a more general antibiotic for a bunch of different types. So it's not as specific as the way that you can think about it. Okay, move, oops, sorry, moving on. Wow, my dogs are not happy to talk about this stuff, I'm telling you. Okay, moving on. Um, antibiotics. The way that they're going to work, there's a whole bunch of different ways. We're actually going to play a game um, about how antibiotics work on cells. But penicillin is going to be an example. And the way that that works is that actually keeps the cell wall from actually forming. That's the way that that's going to work. Um, so now, a lot of people don't understand how antibiotics work. Can you take an antibiotic if you have a virus? I mean, yes, you can, but is it going to do anything? No, right? Because a virus is not living. Antibiotic literally means against life, right? So that's going to be important. The other thing that's important is that antibiotics only go after bacterial cells. They don't go after our type of cells. And the good thing about that is that we are actually able to not have our cells get hurt by the antibiotics, right? The downside is that if you're using a general one, what can happen is it can wipe out all the good and the bad bacteria in your body, and then you could end up with secondary infections and stuff like that. So antibiotics are not always the best thing, and, and like I said, we'll play a game to talk about that. Okay, another thing that bacteria are going to have is something called pili. Um, if you look at this picture here, you can see these kind of hair-like structures that are growing off of it. Those are the pili. Now, they can use that for a couple of things. One of the things they can use that for is to attach to a substrate so that, like, let's say there's strep and they're growing on the back of your throat. Well, your throat, you're constantly swallowing, and those bacteria don't want to go anywhere. They want to feed on you. So they can actually use the pili to attach. Um, they can also use them to attach to each other to form colonies and also to exchange DNA. Because remember, by an, binary fission, there's not really any um, ex DNA exchange going on. So that's something to keep in mind as well. All right, moving on. Oh, what happened to my... 
Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> um, another thing, endospores. Endospores are actually pretty cool. So let's say that the bacteria is getting exposed to some really, really bad conditions um, where it's getting really cold or really dry or something like that. What they can do is they can actually build this endospore over their genome and that can make them kind of go dormant for like centuries and then they can come back when environmental conditions are good. So that could explain why they survived a lot of the crazy ge um, geological things, the events that were going on in the early earth and that kind of thing. Um, so those are going to be endospores. Now in the next video we'll talk about the different metabolic diversity that prokaryotes can have.